It's JD. Can I watch you on the uh, webcam? <laughs> I just, I just, uh, I just, uh, can I? You want to see, see my, man, just my spoons? <laughs> whatever, whatever, dude. <laughs> All right, enough of J.D. Harmeyer. It's a few words with Eric Santa Maria, and not going to spend a ton of time talking right here at the beginning, but I have a couple things before we get into the interview this week, which is a returning guest, the American psycho Alex Payne. I encourage you to look up the archives, not just for the previous episode with Alex Payne, but also the other past guests in many episodes, too. Look us up on SoundCloud and iTunes. Also, follow the podcast Twitter at A Few Words with ES. Like us on Facebook. Send an email with feedback or questions for the Q&A that I will be doing next week. The email is afwpod at gmail.com, and I will be answering your questions. Send it in by any means. You still have time till next week's episode when I will be answering your questions solamente. But in the meantime, Alex Payne will be joining me once again to talk about his wrestling career. Last time we left off where he had moved from Iowa to Pennsylvania to pursue his pro wrestling career at the Ring of Honor Wrestling Academy. And that's basically where we left off. This week, we're going to see how his career in Ring of Honor went being labeled with the name Sugarfoot and all the drama behind that, what led to him touring Japan with Pro Wrestling Noah, coming back and the indies that he's wrestled on since, listen for the fights he gets in with people that are booking him, and that's nothing compared to the fight he gets in in the crowd with a fan at Excite Wrestling, but all that and more on today's episode of A Few Words. And lastly, before we begin, want to say a special thank you to Parker Lewis Can't Lose, that's the username, that really made me smile when I I read the great review that you left on iTunes. Thank you so much for your five stars. And why aren't you, listener, doing the same thing? That's how we grow this show. All your likes, your shares, that's a big one, your reviews. We're not going to get anywhere without your support. So subscribe, download, share, like, follow, all the other stuff that you always do on social media for less worthy podcasts. Come on, people. Spread the good word about a few words and I will keep talking. So thanks again to Parker Lewis Can't Lose. The rest of you follow suit. And right now, let's have a few words once again with the American psycho, Alex Payne. You have a nice drink of your worker water? Uh, my worker water was refreshing. <laughs> How long have you been carrying those jugs, gallons of water around now? It has to be since I was a teenager, probably, 16 years old. Do you have a, a roller bag and fanny pack to complete your... A roller bag, yes, but <laughs> broken wheels, no fanny packs. <laughs> Isn't that the, the wrestler starter kit? <laughs> well, if that was really, truly the case, I'd also need Zubas, and I would need those really pretentious sunglasses from like the 90s, so I don't have them either. <laughs> and a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> you you kind of had that almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. You look a lot better without the curly locks, you I might say. You and me both think that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, last we left off, you were training to be a wrestler at the Ring of Honor Wrestling Academy mm -hmm. in Bristol, Pennsylvania. How was it training under Austin Aries? You said he wasn't uh, the most attentive. Did you get anything out of his class? Because... Again, I think he's one of the, the best wrestlers in ROH history. He's a great wrestler in that regard. You would think that you'd definitely be able to pick up on a lot of things. Well, I'm not saying that I didn't pick up anything. I didn't cultivate a foundation, without a doubt, or I didn't learn my basics from mm -hmm. him. I, I don't think the training was bad at all. I just felt like the encouragement on the training mm -hmm. to keep pushing yourself and make yourself better or keep working on things until you master it 
would help you as a wrestler. And that's what kind of got me discouraged. In Punk's scenario and talking to Punk's students, he would get his students on shows too, where Aries, it seemed like he had that interest. At the it's time. up to you. It's up to you to go and get it yourself, which is, I understand. You have to, you can't always be, you can't be babied. You can't be uh, spoon fed everything. And I wholeheartedly get that. I'm not. One person like, oh, I trained with you, therefore you have to do everything for me, or you have to make sure I get on bookings with you. No, 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 no. I, I, I get that, and I wholeheartedly understand that. But especially when people are, are completely new to the business and don't have any connections necessarily, you would think that there would be some way like, hey, well, we're going to be on a show in Minnesota, or I'm going to have a show, we drive out, we'll go there, or we'll drive out together, or whatever. That sort of thing. I thought that was what happened, because I know with punk students, Punk hooked him up with IWA Mid South bookings, and he helped them that way. So that's something I thought that would come to us too somehow, some way, and it didn't. Um, when things switched over to Brian, Brian's training became a lot more about your like really fine tuning your basics, working on them so that you had them as a, again a more of a foundation. You always rely on them, and then adding, trying to find a way to make yourself different than everyone else if you could. Um, I think the biggest problem at the time was that since we were all so green when it came down to wrestling, we literally, had, yeah, <laughs> yeah, in trunks alone, it was hard to take the criticism. That's the, the criticism, but understand where you should go with yourself as a wrestler, because you would have Brian who's teaching you how to be a good wrestler and who wants you to go home and find watch videos and write down spots and bring it to. To training the next day so you can work on those things and maybe make that yours and make do it, your homework do your homework but then you would have someone in the locker room that would be like if you had the ability to do something tell you don't do it on the, in the pre-shows and that was our ROH matches alone um and it would make it very hard to kind of find yourself some people had had it better i know i enough for nothing had a very hard time finding who alex Payne should be and where he could become himself. I was told like you should be more of an old school style heel, um, work on your punching, your kicks, and throw in some moves here and there, and you know you, you so have more of a methodical pace. And then I'm sure as you're probably gonna bring up here soon, uh, when I was trying to kind of get that in the place shortly afterwards, I'm in Chicago, Illinois, and have a pre-show match and my career goes into a nickname as I'm sure you're going to bring up here shortly. Well, since you brought it up, let's go into uh -huh. that because like you said, this is early on in uh -huh. your career and was Adam Pierce in charge at this point? No, he wasn't. No, uh, Gabe was still in charge. Okay. Hagedorn would conspire with Gabe about the pre-show matches and obviously at shows, you know, there's always talent that's looking to get on dark matches to showcase themselves as well. Us being myself, the Pellies, the Dempseys, you know, those sorts of people, we would be enhancement talent for them to show their, their talents, essentially. And the joke was, with Aries students anyway, that you all had to wear green tights because you are green. Mm -hmm. And that seemed like the permeating attitude to me from the beginning, more or less, with the ROH students. Mm -hmm. And I had mentioned previously that uh, Tyler Black or uh, Seth Rollins, he was at my tryout for Punk's class, but he did not go to the ROH school. I guess he went back to Iowa. He went to Iowa, and then he went to Danny Daniels School in Chicago. And what is frustrating to me especially is that it seemed for a long time, I guess up until recently, but it seemed like forever that if you wanted to succeed in Ring of Honor, don't go to the Ring of Honor school. Because you're going to be forever labeled a student with whatever that means. You're going to be a shitty jobber and no one really cares and you're never really going to get too mm -hmm. much of a push. Obviously, Rhett, if anybody's gone the farthest, but there's never been, per se, this top star, certainly no one to win the title or anything like that, that we can put our stamp on it. Like, this is a guy that we created from the ground up. This is why you should go to the Ring of Honor school because we make stars to this caliber. And for a long time, it seemed like the students were truly the bottom of the barrel, were the bottom rung of the ladder and would always get crapped on and treated like jokes. And that's why I was uh, a little confused about who was in charge at the time, because I remember Pierce would goof on the, do the, the announcing more so than anything else. Right. I never, not for nothing to Pierce's credit, Pierce was actually one of the most constructive 
people for us. He would do like the ring announcing for the matches for the pre-show, um, but he wasn't the one instigating a lot of shit. Oh, honestly, I only remember the, hearing it because okay. I was I was shooting the matches and I remember hearing him announce Ernie full blown Osiris yeah. and other sort of things like that. Maybe so I didn't know jokes. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't know if the Sugarfoot thing was part of that. No, so uh, how that happened? How I remember I had a match booked in the pre-show against uh, a wrestler by the name of Steve Boz. I was in the locker room. We had called the match, whatever, just kind of pacing around. Joe's in the back, and Joe happens to... Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe, yes. Samoa Joe. Not Gypsy Joe. Not Gypsy Joe. Not that old man. <laughs> um, you know, Samoa Joe was in the back, and he goes to Bobby Cruz, like, someone should be so Sugarfoot tonight. And Bobby's like, okay. I mean, he kind of shrugged it and whatever. And there's no meaning. It had like, no there, meaning. It had nothing. And it's not like he like pointed out like that. Guy, that's this or hey, we're gonna make fun of that guy for that. You just like someone should be called that, right? Like there was a kickboxer that was known as Sugarfoot, uh, but yeah, because he was knocking people yeah, out with his kicks. Right. This I, was no meaning at all. No, just a goof. Not at all. And though I think there may be um, some sort of press company that is in Chicago that they use a Sugarfoot logo or okay. something. But maybe he saw that there too. But I know Joe's a big MMA fan, so maybe he thought that. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And it's funny enough, in the back, in the office that that week, I remember Jimmy bringing up that Davey Richards should use the name Sugarfoot because he has such sweet kicks. <laughs> so like, okay, like uh, maybe possibly he has he had devastating kicks, and maybe it might, and maybe it would have worked for him. Who knows? At least Sugarfoot sounds better than right leg. <laughs> well, right leg, not for nothing, was pr- pretty solid. But, no, I, but, I, 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 I liked Andy Ray. No, a lot. so did I. Yeah. It's just right leg ain't the best nickname to No, me, it's but. not. <laughs> no, it's not. But at least I had a backstory. Rhett has a match with, I forgot who it was. It may have been Josh Abercrombie or something. And Rhett goes out and Bobby Cruz decided not to like, call him that. I was like, oh, maybe he's just not going to do it. Cool. So Boz goes out and then here over the microphone, I hear... From Des Moines, Iowa, this is Alex Sugarfoot. And I just look back and then finishes up the my entrance. And I'm just like, okay, whatever. I shrugged it. I shrugged at it. I, I, I didn't really, I didn't react negatively or anything to it. I just kind of shrugged it off. Whatever. Well, uh, it, I remembered it a this, little different. No, this is different. You're probably thinking of multiple other times where I was like, oh, okay. I'm, nope. I remember the Frontier Fieldhouse and I, it's burned in my memory because mm-hmm. I was up and on there's the... there's many instances of this and I hope you know this because as far as I, and I'll tell you how I recall that, I shrug, okay, I shrug it, okay, cool, have the match, whatever, done. Go to the back, it is what it was. Then, I didn't really make a stink or anything about it whatsoever, but my concern was like, okay, we had our fun, cool, you announced me for fun, it was one night. By the end of the night, having like when I was doing my jobs as a greenhorn of doing security around or helping do the lights or whatever, you have these fans, you know, saying this to you as you're in mid job, and not for nothing. Like you, we were dressed, told to dress in black, so we kind of didn't uh, deter anything or stand, or, or out. stand out too much. I didn't want to get in trouble for one, going up to the lights and having one sugar foot, sugar foot, and I just wanted to like mind my business and do my job and not get in trouble. Who wouldn't? You know, you have people that you're not trying, especially if you have like a Roger Strong and they're having like a 20 minute match with somebody or, or Aries having like a, a serious match. And then you hear this random, you know, 15 people in the crowd start chanting this while you're, they're going to think of someone trying to take away from a match or is someone trying to like get heat on themselves or whatever. Like, I didn't want that sort of heat. So there is that. And then I did ask Bobby Cruz a couple weeks later when we were in Philly, hey, would you mind like, would we not call myself that? And, uh, He's like, yeah, you know, that's cool. You know, no problem. We stopped hearing it until we got back to to Chicago in August. And then that's, now here's where it comes, where it returns. We're in Chicago. I'm wrestling Davey Richards, actually. And who, I think it was, I think it may have been, it may have been Bobby. Because Bobby had just had a, a tryout with the WWE and thank, he thought he was going away. And, and maybe he and he had kind of an attitude. A Bobby bit of an, Cruz, yeah, but never, bit of, yeah. And I, and I like Bobby Cruz. Don't get me wrong, um, but he had a bit of an attitude that night. And he goes up to Gabe, like, "Call him Sugarfoot," and, and Gabe's like, "What? What?" <laughs> and he didn't know what the fuck it was it was being said. Him, and Justin, we're gonna call him Sugarfoot. And he's like, "Yeah, whatever." And I go, "Oh, please, no!" Like you know, like really, like we we did that one time do we have to come back and do that again and then gabe just goes i can do whatever i want with you i can dress you up in a diaper and call you a baby if i want to which to this day always makes reminds me of how much gabe thinks he's 
he's holier than thou or that he, he he's this god to independent wrestling yes you, you have a decent mind for professional wrestling and that not nothing some of your ideas were permeated from other people spitting in your ear a couple times too i.e let's look at cm punk danielson with his stuff but just because everybody wants to work for you doesn't necessarily mean you have to act like you're fucking vince mcmahon you know i'm young you're have the opportunity to potentially make or break me in my early years granted some people who have early careers their early gimmicks don't really catch on and go anywhere but this is ring of honor okay and that's the big difference ring of honor is watched by thousands of independent wrestling fans and is seen worldwide you had the fight network you had uh, opportunities in the UK with TV, I believe. Um, Samurai TV. Samurai TV. You have all these places. You're, you're sending tapes down to Puerto Rico or Mexico or may have been. I sent to, all those tapes. And you sent those tapes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, man, I don't, want to, I don't want to be a laughing stock. I don't want to be a joke. And, and not for nothing. And being in the back office and hearing, about, hearing from Jimmy about MMA and everything. And being a fan as well. Or just a fan of professional wrestling. Just in general, I'm thinking, oh, I can't kick this save my fucking life. Like, I have no background in this. I can't, I'm a look at fucking laughing stock. What, I throw a drop kick and that's the sugar foot? Like, no, that's not not what I want to be. And that's not what I wanted to turn into. And that might disappoint everyone, every Chicago fan in the world that like, hey, man, I thought he was having fun with that. And I thought that was his name. No, Alex Payne really genuinely just wanted to be a wrestler that would develop himself much like a Kyle O'Reilly or an Adam Cole did and be taken a bit seriously and and potentially, potentially, I'm not saying take myself too seriously in life, but you have to have some fun with wrestling by all means, but allow me to grow and find myself as a wrestler instead of, hey, you're greener than goose shit and you may you're, you're just going to do this gimmick but all that's so they can have some sort of power over you of and feel better about themselves in their own little way so they can always goof on you because they can mm -hmm. or do those sort of things to make themselves feel better about themselves and what i was going to say before is what's burned in my mind is when I thought it was the first time, perhaps I'm mistaken, but when I heard you announced in the ring as mm -hmm. Sugarfoot, I remember just the way your head jerked around, like, what the hell is this? I remember that's oh, how... Oh, I did my jerk around, like, okay, okay, we're going with it. Yeah. But we didn't, like, oversell it or anything. No, and nor the way you reacted no, at but first. I, like, they actually, it's, it's, it threw me off. It was like, yeah. okay, I heard my real... I hear Alex, and then I was like, okay, it's going to be pain. And I see that I hear, I'm like, man, okay, you got me here. It did throw you for a second. It did throw me for a second. I'm not going to lie. I was like, really? Like, this is actually going to happen? And yeah, it spawned into two to three years of hearing it cons consistently or in a lot of ways not being taken seriously in terms of bookings or being taken seriously as far as my own home company goes. And I'm not saying that I need to be revered as a Roderick Strong, but I was still green as, or a Brian Danielson. I wasn't trying and mind a lot of people that may have been my peers. I was never trying to be Brian. I was never trying to be Aries. I just wanted to be someday as good as that they were that they would be in the ring. Much like I'm sure Rhett wanted to be at least as good as Aries or better one day for that matter. And and who wouldn't? If you train with somebody, you want to be uh, a sample of who they are to some degree. You want to be a, a, a breed of, a, a, not necessarily a replica. A reflection. A reflection. And that would go a long way, whether it's the way you are psycho psychologically or the way you are character-wise or just whatever, it may, or just the way your foundation or how your demeanor is in the locker room. I wasn't trying to ever cause riffraff. I wasn't trying to ever cause a scene. I kept myself 99.9% .9 of the time. All I wanted was just to learn. And uh, now I'm like, okay, now you're throwing a riff. And then it became more of just like a, a joke. A and, meme. Uh, yeah, it a meme. Yeah, a lot of ways. And it kind of hurt because I'm like, man, this is what I dreamed about as a teenager. And I just wanted to excel. I wanted, not for nothing, I'm not going to lie. I wanted to be one day remembered like, like a Samoa Joe or a CM Punk or... King of the uh, Indies? Uh, yeah, yeah, or Chris <laughs> Daniels or, or any of those guys because that was the goal. And then eventually maybe go to WWE or go to Japan or whatever or, or do multiple things, go to TNA, whoever, or go, or go back and forth and have a fulfilling wrestling career. What happens is 
you get people thinking, oh, he's just a joke, and you're not really that good. And, well, you're not going to get that much bookings, and you're not going to wrestle against many great wrestlers on the indie scene. Because you're considered a joke. Yeah, and that's kind of it was. And uh, not and not for nothing, like, there's people that have come out of the ROH Wrestling Academy since me and since others that have seen a dramatic amount of success and have done a lot more things than I ever had that chance to do. And I give them credit for sticking it out and doing what they had to do or doing whatever it was to get them further. And I hope they're, I hope, I hope great success upon them eventually. It just stinks that I was never loved or cultivated or, or considered enough of the time. And I also don't think I, I felt a, a lot of the trainees were in limbo, especially for a good year and a half or so. They didn't really have anybody stand up for them. Be like, hey, these kids bust their ass and they travel a thousand miles one direction, another thousand miles another direction to set up a ring and pay their dues. And we're going to treat them like they're fucking like horse shit. It's a big difference, a big difference between when some of these veterans break into the wrestling business in their territory, I'll say the Midwest or, or in California or Florida, Florida, and you're going up and down the pike of that state or that little region in itself. Whereas this is ring of honor and we're going from Pennsylvania to Boston, Boston, Chicago, to, 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 Minnesota. Down, down from Boston to New York from Pennsylvania and then back and then, or Pennsylvania to Canada, whether it's Montreal back down to Toronto and then back going out to, Going from Pennsylvania, I'm oh, sorry, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, mind you, all the way out Pittsburgh. to Pitts, well, Pittsburgh or to Buffalo, Buffalo, Detroit into Chicago, Chicago into wherever, spending multiple nights on the road, whatever it might be, getting barely any rest, wrestling a five minute match, and then like, oh, you're the shits because you're o- you're overtired, you're you're beat up, you're you're worn out. It's not the same as okay. You took down a ring, you put it on the back of a trailer, you you drove about an hour or two, and then you and then you go and you have your next show. Bigger difference, mm-hmm. and then you can have a better time to recoup in between, and then you can have a, a 15, 20 minute match. Bigger difference. So, how does your early career go with this Sugarfoot label? Was there ever an idea to embellish it in any way? I don't think there was ever an idea for any of it. Honestly, I think it was like, hey, just you know, do work with it. It was a rib that would make me angry. I pitched that idea, like, why don't we do that and like make it into a joke, where then I fucking go crazy. That's what happened with the yes stuff. Yeah, it started with no, no, right? Which, which, I mean, it is its its own thing. Let's run with it. Make me agitated and like it it drives me fucking crazy. Then maybe we can change something about me um, and make me a heel instead. Whatever, anything, and but it just wasn't getting anywhere because I was just again I was a greenhorn and I really had no place with you know pitching ideas. I guess and it was again frustrating because when there wasn't a trainer like me and Hagdorn, um, maybe Pelly once in a while, uh, Kyle Durden, Kyle Davis, we would train amongst ourselves just to kind of like keep ourselves you know busy working out in the ring until there was an actual trainer again when when Delirious took over as the trainer and then there there was a school and then we can learn new stuff and then we we're really really busting our ass now. But it, it got harder. It got much harder to like, first during that maybe that time frame when like Brian left to when Delirious took over, there was really no direction for us as students whatsoever. And I know some people got chances on the main show here and there in job matches, but but Alex Payne never really had a focus. And not for the years you're going to have a fo- everyone's going to have a focus or a spot, especially when you're really, really young. But I know I had tried to branch out and do matches for Chikara uh, or do some local indie shows here and there, uh, go to IWC and just try my best to like, hey, if I get my name out there and wrestle some better people, maybe that will stand out. And I know Rhett, to, and to his credit, he was wrestling all throughout New Jersey and doing some PA shows here and there. And I was like, well, he's going to do that. Well, let me do further out there some more. And maybe I had a little bit of an internal competitive edge with him because he was definitely also someone who was wanting to make this something. And Plus, he was also Aries' guy, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So, and that I didn't see a lot of other students going too far out of the way to get bookings of, on their own. And I know I try to help people. I try to help uh, Hagedorn. I try to help Ernie, Pelly, everyone I possibly can. But I was like, if we all get on, all get together uh, in a van or whatever, get on some bookings, let's do it. You know, and there would be some people, some promoters would reach out to us, thinking that we were cheap, 
and we would wrestle. God, we, we were, we would, we were cheap also compared to like the Brian Danielsons of the world and Nigel McGinnis's. Sure. So they could make like, ROH wrestlers are on the show. Okay. Or Team ROH is, is here. Like, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we embody Team ROH. Yeah. That's like when WWF brought over WCW guys and instead of Nash and Goldberg, it's Mark Jindrak and Chavo Guerrero. <laughs> yeah. We're really not the embodiment of that. Like you would think of Brian Danielson or right. Nigel McGuinness or Roderick Strong would be your three man team or something like that. Not to knock us, but we aren't necessarily the embodiment. We're not the main event guys, really. But it would be hard. It made it very difficult. And as far as getting bookings went, it was tough and try and being looked at as anything significant to your peers. Granted, we're green. Yes, we're gonna take some shit. It happens with everything, whether it's sports related or you joining or you joining a school or whatever. But it's after a certain point in time, enough's enough. Let us branch out, or at least hear us out on our ideas, which made thing no one was listening to us really. Once in a while, maybe one person, one person that you might actually catch their ear and might listen. But it was very tough. Well, how was it like going from, I guess you were on some main shows. I remember. I would get main show opportunities only in Chicago once in a while. And then. That was a pay-per-view one, right? A four-way maybe you got a big win or something? Well, we'll take it back to, take it back even further. Um, before that happened, when it was still under Gabe's booking. Yeah, I was going to say, like going from Gabe to Pierce to Delirious. About 2008 is when I started, got, started getting more opportunity on main shows. Um, Gabe was booking. I remember teaming up. Silas Young or Dingo or somebody. Against, I like Dingo. I like Dingo too. He's a good guy. <laughs> against Rhett and Delirious. So there was a tag match there that I was able to do. And that was a fun, you know, you know, eight minute, 10 minute match. And I thought I did a damn good job there. And there was no momentum. At this time, I was getting, you know, these random end of way bookings here or there, or I was getting a Chikara booking here or there. And so, like, I was accumulating bookings outside of ROH. And and some were recurring bookings too. So I'm like, all right, this is good. I'm I'm showing my I'm showing my worth. Like these BWOs and these LWOs and uh, other the, WOs. Oh yeah, <laughs> and this tri-state this and UWC that. You know, like all these. And like I was getting, I was accumulating bookings where I could, whether I was wrestling other other ROH graduates or other people from the Indies scene that helped. And there and I was like, well, this is gonna help me out. This is awesome. I'm 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 making you. I'm making most of my time. And I'm showing that when I'm not wrestling for ROH, I'm, I'm trying to get better as much and, and also get on reputable independent shows like Chikara, for instance. So I, I so Gabe would see that and be like, oh, wow, you know, Justin's on shows, Alex is on shows, and he's getting he's getting booked. Because not to name names, but there were other students I know that you were frustrated with wouldn't try to yeah. get as many bookings as they could. Yeah, and- I, I grant, Rhett was always one of those people that was always very consistent about it. I know Grizzly was definitely trying to get him shows on as many shows as he possibly could. Um, you so were putting in the effort. That's putting the effort too, and 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 these guys were, and, and those two, two guys definitely were, and Pelly would too. Um, there are just other people that just weren't doing it as much, um, and that's frustrating. And they would have main show spots, um, whether they're doing something or nothing on the shows period, which is frustrating, or not even come to practice period, and they're blown to hell. Um, that's frustrating because you're just like you're. Bu- I'm busting my ass. I'm busting my ass to trying to gain some momentum and try to be a good wrestler so i can wrestle in a this organization and be again a reflection of what i was trained or other a reflection of the training i, I received so after that hap- that that tag match there really wasn't much of of me on main shows once i'll be in like a scramble here or there um then a big opportunity came when gabe was fired and adam pierce took over and pierce at the time was someone that would you could bend his ear and he would listen to you and he seemed caring and and he ran like a friend and he like really wanted to see you do better and even as sugarfoot like he's like you could do this this and this and i was eventually i started to bend I'm like yeah, let, let me just try to see if i can make this work for a while because if i could make it work for a while it could and it was over one place it could possibly get over at others potentially plus being that he was a wrestler you'd think he would have been more sympathetic to your case than gabe who wasn't yeah. let's say Absolutely. I thought that that was part of it. Um, and he had always good constructive criticism for me. And when he came became the booker, I had the pay-per-view four-way with Claudio, Silas, and Sammy. Sammy who? <laughs> Callahan. Okay. Um, I didn't know if it was Sammy Sol- Zane. Sol- <laughs> Solomon Crow. Well, Sammy Zane, uh, Generico, I remember after the match, was glowing 
about the match. Uh-huh. Like he said it was like one of the funnest matches he ever had watched. And that, that meant a lot because he was a guy who was main eventing Ring of Honor shows, world title matches, tag team ladder matches. Like to have that guy you tell you he enjoyed your match, that that made me that made me happy. Like you know, like that meant something to me, especially with and having Brian, you know, make the save at the end and you know and he he, he comes give up, you the rub. He, he give you the rub. And then not even just that, like in the ring tell me that was a good job. That made me like go like man, I made my trainer I made a trainer of mine very, very proud. And not for nothing, I consider Brian was how much time he spent with me my trainer because he really worked hard with us and he worked hard with me and Pelly and, and and Chris so damn much that I take ownership of him being my being a trainer of mine. Maybe he doesn't take ownership of me. That's cool, but it's maybe, and disappointing maybe to some degree because I know I'm not like TJ Perkins or anybody else that he trained, but he seemed proud. Those time frames were very, very emotional in a lot of ways because you know I'm f- finding like this hard work paying off. I'm getting somewhere with this hard work, and you know maybe and things will open up. And it just like I would get like a, a main show opportunity in Chicago, for instance, and then nothing else would follow through, which is fa- it was frustrating. And then I come back to Chicago for another pay-per-view and I get a victory in Chicago. Then we get TV and uh, granted I'm wrestling Claudio and it wasn't the best match. I was sick. I was definitely sick and I was under the weather. Um, and then the next night wrestling Nigel, it wasn't the greatest match in the world, but it was better than I my, my, my Claudio match was. Cesaro for yes. some of our more mainstream fans in WWE. I had those opportunities and then shortly after that, the, the next couple of... HD net tapings. I was enhancement work. Most of the students were. In, yeah, in it those. was. It definitely was. I'm not saying that I had to. Again, like, Rhett would have at least a competitive, you know, loss or or, or something, or he might beat uh, Grizzly Redwood or something. Yeah, like wasn't there a match you had with I think Mark Briscoe? Well, let's go. Let's go to that match. Actually, yeah. let's let's talk about that match. Mark had just come back from injury. Is he? Any injury, mm-hmm. surgery. He'd been out for probably like five or six months. And I was probably, I think it was, I was his first singles match. We have this match tonight. It's about like, a, we have like six or eight minutes, something like that. I said, we'll, like, we'll ask him first of what he thought of the match. And then I, and he's, I don't know, I don't have any ideas yet. And I'm like, okay, well, I have an idea. Would you mind if I pitched it to you? And he's like, yeah, sure, you can do that. I like the Briscoes. I love the Briscoes. They're great guys. And they're honestly very supportive people too. Not for nothing. So, not for nothing. What do you mean? <laughs> She's saying that a lot, not for nothing. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was able to pitch the idea of, can I clip your knee in, in my comeback? He's like a light bulb went off. And he's like, yeah, that's, let's do that. That's hot. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we put, put together uh, the match, mostly him kicking my ass, but I got to have a comeback on him, which ended in a submission. And the comeback was backflip over him, land my feet, give him the chop block, the, the Philly fans boo the shit out of me and I just get up a little cocky about it and it worked and it worked <laughs> and, I, and I'm like I'm cocky about it and I smirk about it and the camera catches me like smiling like I get a chance to kind of like glow for a second I'm ready and, for my close up Mr. Pierce and, uh, and, I, and not even like and not in like I, I got, I'm marking out yeah no 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 like I mean like being like should I have some character? Like uh-huh. I can be like I can be sly, be coy, more than a one or two dimensional character. Work, exactly, for a and that's what you're supposed to show, right? Work the knee. Uh, I do a couple of things. I throw on a submission, and the crowd's getting behind it. And Mark's coming back. You know, he's getting out of the submission. Then he, we we cover on a spot, and he bent, he ends up beating me. Cool. Jay comes in. He taps me on the on the back as I'm trying to sell it up, and he's like, "That was great work." And uh, and I, I kind of like smile a bit to myself, think, thinking, "Damn right it was! Like that was fun. That was that was fun." And then I walked to the back, and as soon as I walked through the curtain, Pierce is like, "What the fuck was that?" And I'm like, yeah, "You're not supposed to be a heel." I think, uh, uh, and I so I walked to the, I walked past, and I'm like, "I'm like, whatever." Walk to the back. Finally, and, had something to sink your teeth into, yeah, and something you did have, it have, something wrong. Yeah, I did something <laughs> wrong. And I, but but the thing is, put sympathy on him a little bit, just for two seconds. Look, Mark Briscoe, slightly sympathetic, and he just came back from injury. Like you would think, he's gonna, he may have a weakness, and someone smart would want to try to take that, take the knee. Okay, whatever. Moving on. I get to the back. There's Prince Donna. There's Dark City Fight Club. There's a few other guys around. What is that called? I was like, it was called. Yes, it was called. Your reaction to how you clipped the knee was awesome, and like that was so smart, and like they they. Like they really thought I did a damn good job, and then Aries comes by me and he goes, "What the fuck was that?" And they're like, you, "You're you're not a heel," and I'm like, "But it got a reaction. I got a good reaction for 
mark who's the bigger star. And it was only a few minute long match, yeah, right? I was, I, was, I, was like, I wasn't going to business for myself. I wasn't trying to shoot on him or anything. I was literally just trying to make the match seem that much more of a response. And he got a hell of a fucking pop for even beating me. So he would have beat me and gotten that same pop either way, but at least there he had someone to beat. Right. And someone was going after him, and which is the whole point. You have six or seven minutes. Let's do that. And then let's go, let's move forward a couple more months into TV tapings again. I'm wrestling Sanjay Dutt. I have a really competitive match with him. All right, guess what I find out the next time? I'm wrestling Austin Aries, who's now the world champion. And second time, right? Yeah. Second time I've mm-hmm. had of wrestling Aries. I wrestled Aries uh, on a Chicago match four or five months prior to that second run as a world champion as a heel as a heel now and he's doing his uh austin aries lethal lottery whatever he wants to call it um a double thing and i i get to pick and i get to be uh the lucky winner to get a title shot and the night prior he wrestled grizz he gets all this offense but when i ask for you know like we get we get time we get like five minutes i get not i'm not supposed to get anything really besides a side russian sweep and that's it. And I'm like, okay, what the fuck? I'm also a bit taller than Grizz, and you gave Grizz a million things in the world. And that's nothing against Grizz. Grizz is talented. But, but if fine. you're not one of his boys. I'm not, if I'm not, if yeah. I'm not one of, I, I'm a, I'm a, I should be, right? I, I train under him, right? It was very frustrating because I'm like, all right, well, damn it. Like, we're in, we're in the middle of the match, and he's putting heat on me. And he always taught me, you know, if there's, if there's dead space, you know, you bring it to the person, even if you're in a squash, making sure that they look like they're, they're, they fight somebody. So I kicked him in the stomach, and, or I fought back a little bit, and he got, seemed getting frustrated about it. Uh oh. Yeah. So whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Like, it, it's pro wrestling. It is what it is. But, I just felt, I felt, again, by him especially, like I was insignificant and I didn't matter. And the, maybe there was his own deep seating hatred towards me for whatever fucking reason. Maybe because I don't kiss his ass or uh, or I didn't smoke weed with him or, or whatever. But need, needless to say, I'm just, I was frustrated. And I was very, very, very frustrated at that point in time because I was getting yo yo between main show scramble matches. I had won a match on pay per view. You think it would go somewhere. Granted, sometimes a couple of my showings on main shows were not the best showings. I'm not going to lie. I hadn't always had the best record of having the best performances. But I also was trying so much shit out that I didn't know what to do. And I was trying so much to try to be, to stand out. That I didn't know where I could be or what I should be doing with the Sugarfoot label on your yeah, head. Yeah, With that yeah. on my head. And I, and I, I didn't know where to go with this and there was no direction for me in the first place. So maybe if people have more direction and definitely not for nothing as my year later, as my career later expanded and when I could create direction for myself, I will, I sharpened my shit up a lot more too. So that certainly helps, but not for nothing. Either way, you look at it, you, you move on. Like you, it, it, it was the past was the past at that point, and that's where it kind of led me into just getting more frustrated. I had wrestled Rhett on a, a, an HG net taping and had a competitive match with him, and, and it sounded like we were going to do something. Was that allowed? It was allowed that time because it was Rhett. I was like, I could I could have a competitive match with Rhett, and uh, that turned out to be a solid match. Rhett won with, I think, a roll-up and pull the tights, and I thought, well, maybe we're going to do something with this. And it wasn't like a fuck finish or anything. It was just like, hey, you know, he, he cheated to win. Maybe we're going to go somewhere with this. Cool. Did nothing. And then afterwards, it became another series of squash matches, and then I was written off TV with Pierce saying that I would be back at some point, but no direction for it. Was that Dark City Fight Club? No, that was... the Dark City Fight Club was months prior to that wow. but the, the, i was wrestling carino and steen and they, they beat they, the they crap beat, out of me right? yeah. mean all that stuff yeah i remember being because i was there pretty much i think for all the hd net tapings mm-hmm. and i knew going in like oh this is gonna be your write-off mm-hmm. right around this time I, if i'm not mistaken we started doing pro wrestling respect we just started yeah yeah delirious and i we got together to do this basically sister promotion for ring of honor mm-hmm as really a response to the way a lot of students were booked. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way it was initially intended. And we wanted to do things more to our liking, more to our way. You had mentioned how you were frustrated about the Sugarfoot thing. Like, let's turn this into a thing that it annoys me, it drives me crazy. And this is really where you started doing that, at least to my eyes, where eventually you transformed into the American psycho later on. Mm -hmm. When you first started doing the Respect shows, it was the feud between you and Shane Hagedorn. And how did you like 
wrestling for us and the way that went on for the year or so we did it. I enjoyed it when it initially started, uh, without a doubt. The biggest thing about it was like, okay, this is an opportunity for all of us as graduates. I say, I'm going to stop saying students because we, a lot of us, were gra- we graduated at the time. We just needed to have a consistent place to go to that could build a story that was kind of ROH related. And we were hoping that this could be that. And maybe go from a show that would be like once every other month to maybe a monthly show eventually where it would connect and hopefully peers would watch these matches. I want to watch these matches back and be like, who's getting better and who's, who's developing. And I want that to be the way I could build this new Alex Payne. And I wanted to expand upon it. The idea of wrestling Hagdorn was a matter of he is coming off of being on the shelf for nine plus months and not wrestling, having surgeries and him being bitter that he never really got to, the chance to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. So he's going to kind of start from scratch himself a little bit. Why do I not beat my peers in order to do that first? He had his team. I had my team. He beat us in the first, in the first, first show, first match. And that, that was a start for our feud. But the idea for the personal respect, I thought was a great concept. We needed a place for guys that w- had not really accrued a bunch of bookings really, or, didn't have the outlet to, to wrestle, grow to, to yeah. grow yet. And we were hoping that this maybe could be a way for you to put out more footage out there and get more, get more exposure for us and maybe put a match on the ROH website and show like what we're doing and show that Ernie Osiris and Grizzly Redwood could have a 15 minute match that actually garners a reaction and had that some oomph to has it. some oomph to it and had some moves and spots that were freaking awesome, which you certainly have highlighted on the the wrestling roundtable page. You put that on there, and thousands of people watch that. Thousands of views hit that. Like, let's call, let's call spade a spade. Like, we there, we wanted, we want that. And you would think, even for your school, you'd want to advertise how good your students are getting or the progress they're getting, because you want continuous revenue to come in from people who would want to actually join your school. It never made sense to me to do the opposite. Like, why would you want all of your students to be geeks Married. and jobbers and jokes? If I'm thinking about joining a wrestling school, why would I want to join up with that? You'd want to go to a place that is going to cultivate stars and really fulfill your dreams. No one sits around dreaming up their fantasy of wrestling. I'm going to have this music and this gimmick and this these moves and whatever to be Sugarfoot. <laughs> no, not at all. Ring of Honor, not for nothing, is is and was an independent wrestling company of its own. Not for nothing. Like it's it's the truth. They're not they're not an ABC wrestling league that has a few bodies that come in and watch them every other month or once a month. This is a company that's trying to cultivate into a an established organization. And it's gonna be hard not for it's gonna be hard for me or someone else to to catch wind whether you have extremely talented people around you for all intents and purposes to say i'm not going to wrestle like roderick strong i'm not going to wrestle like a delirious or an austin aries or a jimmy jacobs but there should be at least an opportunity for us to grow and get better and better and better or be highlighted here and there or do some spots here and there amongst our peers or have a, a five or six or eight or ten minute match whether it's amongst each other in a dark or a pre-show, for that matter, or an opening contest, so we can learn more and not have okay, you get three minutes or you get two minutes, and it's, it's a pre-show match. I mean, come on, like give us a, give, have like a couple solid matches and make it work. And with the pro and respect idea, it was like, hey, let's give these kids time. Let's give these ten kids time. Let's advertise it. Let's get the ROH fans to come and see that they can actually do more than just the minimal at this point. And that's the important part. That's what I thought we were going to do. And I thought it worked for a little while. Um, I thought me and Hagedorn's feud ended where it needed to. So I went off to, uh, to Pro Wrestling Noah and to train the dojo there. And then by the time I came back, and then there had been a bunch of dead time between the return and the next show. They had their sixth show at that point in time. 
that was the, the sixth and final straw, and there was nothing to do after that with it. Well, you finagled your way into pro wrestling, Noah. <laughs> Ring of Honor, we had a relationship with them. If you're an NXT fan, you'd know Hideo Itami. Yep. Is, that's Kenta's name now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in Ring of Honor, you know Morishima and Marafuji and Noah, this offshoot of all Japan that started off, right? Yep. They had so many great wrestlers and matches and this and that. And there was somewhat of a talent trade a little bit mm -hmm. between the two companies. So how did you end up as a student? You weren't like a uh, Cole Cabana or Nigel or, or whatever. Chris Hero or anybody like Yeah. That. So how did you end up having a tour of Pro Wrestling Noah in Japan? My frustration is what got me there, really. I was at the ROH office. It was like September of 2009 and really just banging my head against the wall, like trying to figure out like, what can I do? Like, I'm so sick and tired of being yo-yo back and forth between main show, uh, dark matches, pre-show matches, like not having any consistency and going to Pierce and asking, what can I do? What can I do? I'm granted, I'm sure he has a million other people asking the same thing about pushes and whatever. Like, what can they do to get better? <laughs> One of his uh, bright ideas was like, shave your head and grow a beard, or grow a beard and dye your hair. Not for nothing, granted, as time progressed, what did I do? I shaved my head, and, I, and now I got a freaking bit of a goatee beard and all that stuff. God damn it, Justin! <laughs> I should have listened to my. I should have listened to him uh, six years ago, but I also didn't have the ability, granted, I, I've never really, really grow facial hair much at that time frame, and I didn't want to give up <laughs> long hair and all that stuff. So that, that, that's, that was me being stubborn, but needless to say... I wanted something. I wanted something to sink myself, to sink my teeth into. That's all I wanted. And changing, I didn't think changing my physical characteristics could do that. I thought I, when I did other indie shows, I could be arrogant and cocky. I could be a heel. And I could be more than just like the average Joe Bland heel. I thought, shit, he thinks all the cookie cutter, baby faces, blonde hair, blue eyes, come baby on, baby. Face sheets, come on, babies, yeah. all it worked. But then I, I made arguments like, Look at guys like Shane Douglas, for instance. Not to say that I was a Shane Douglas, but you were he, a Shane Douglas fan. I'm, I, I, I was. Franchise. And I, a lot of people. A lot of people. Oh, well, a lot of people were. But let's look at. It. Let's look at what he was told. You could never be. You never could be a heel. You never could be a heel. The way you look, you could be a heel. Look at him. One he, of the best he, heels, the best heels at in the, the fucking time. business. Yeah. One of the best heels in the business. Period. In a discussion, especially in when we were doing shows at the ECW arena or the new all new Alhambra arena or whatever 2300 arena, 20, the arena, arena. Yes. Yeah. South Rittner street, whatever the hell it yep. is. Uh, I thought, well shit, give me up. They're booing me anyway at TV tapings and then cheer me in Chicago. We're doing more TV tapings in the Northeast to begin with. Why not just go ahead and run with it? Fuck it. Like give me Mark Briscoe, been a great, a great chance. Like me to clip the knee out. Give me a, uh, an indie superstar and have a match where I just become a whiny little bitch at the end. Let me be, let me be Chris Jericho, 1997 or 1998 and bitch complain about losing all the time. Give me something. And like, you don't have to change my physical look or anything. Just give me something to have an attitude about. And that's all I wanted. And that's not to say the details don't matter. Obviously they do. Yes. Sometimes it's like, why doesn't he just cut his hair? Yep. Why doesn't he just do this instead? But that isn't the main overriding thing. You wanted something to sink your teeth into. Like you Even said, as baby uh, face, give me something, you know, like I had no problem if, if there was going to be a chance for me to team with Dingo or somebody, for instance, or Delirious or something. Uh, I remember Delirious even pitching what we did a six way match pitching. He was supposed to go over and he asked Adam, could we put Justin over instead? And he's like, no, can't have that happen. Can't. No, can't have it happen. <laughs> can't. It's like, it's a fucking six way. And if I pinned, uh, Rhett Titus or or uh, whoever local Chicago guy that was in that match who's probably only going to be in and out for a night. That doesn't mean that anything. doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, I'm not I'm not saying that I have to beat Delirious or I have to beat Silas Young or I have to beat uh, whoever else was in that match uh, who may have been a more of an established guy. But we, couldn't we have done something like something or do a double pin? He was he was such. Can we do double pin? Like okay, like something happened. I'm not saying I'm, I'm a mark for fucking winning matches, and not for nothing. I've lost more matches in my career than I've won, and I don't care. Like really, really don't. I'd rather have just have a good match and, and walk away happy than have to. Oh, I got a victory or I win a belt. That's not the thing. Uh, it's the work I uh, put into it. And I want to have something to kind of work with. That's I think that's the goal of any wrestler. You want to sink your teeth into a story or into a position or into an idea and be able to work with it. 
And if you can work with it and have something to manipulate and maneuver and can tell a good story or have a good match with it, then at the end of the day, you're fucking happy and you want to pay off to go to ascend to the next level. Getting back onto the pro wrestling Noah subject, I was just frustrated and, and we were in the office and Sid could see me frustrated. He's asking what's going on and I go, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm banging my head against the wall and he's like, I'll get you into Japan. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, no, you won't. And, and he's like, yeah, like, I'll talk to Ken Haryama. Uh, we'll, we'll take you onto a tour to Japan. I'm like, there's no fucking way they're going to take me. There's no there's no way in hell they'd want me. I'm, I'm not Brian Danielson. I'm not Nigel. I'm not any of these guys. And I, I'm saying that right to you. I'm not that person. Talking no, I, him out of it. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not even, I'm not even talking him out of it. I'm like, I, I just know they won't be interested. I just felt like they, there's no way in hell they'd be interested in me because what have I ever done? And I, and I haven't cultivated any sort of... Uh, name value here. Well, Ken worked at the Hawaii office Correct. for Pro Wrestling Noah, and he would call the office all the time. He was on the phone with me or Sid all the time. Mm-hmm. Very nice man. All of a sudden, it's November, and we're in Toronto, and I wrapped up wrestling a, a match, and he comes to the back, and he's like, uh, I hear you want to come to Japan. My my jaw drops, my and I go, that would be awesome. Well, let's talk about it a little bit. Um, you have to stay, you know, for a few months. We have to see when our next class is wrapping up or, or, or our last tour, people wrap up and we'll kind of figure things out. And I, I, I told them, like, right now I'm in college too. So it have to be like during like my summer semester, if anything, because I really can't take a lapse in, in, uh, in school at the moment. So I want to at least fit that in. Like I want to make sure studies were important. Wrestling was important too, but I want to make sure to be able to work out both. They were able to work with me on that. So we decided that in June of 2010, I would have the chance to go out to Pro Wrestling NOLA, and now I train in their dojo. And that's how more so that turned out, is I was just frustrated with Ring of Honor, and not get anywhere, and I didn't know what else to do. And like, maybe I have to train harder, or I have to like be a little more self-destructive, or whatever it might be. Like, I just gotta, I gotta do something, and that's where I ended up. And you were written off of Ring of Honor at this point, mm-hmm. so you weren't wrestling. Were you working in the office still? I was not working in the office anymore. I would come in and do like side jobs. I would like come if they needed me for graphic design, if they needed me to design the DVDs or T-shirts. Like I would come after school and I would work on that sort of stuff. But uh, I wasn't full time anymore at that point. Was it just budget cuts? Yeah, they had. Uh, I guess they had to cut. A few dollars here or there. You were the first to I go. I was the first to go. Yeah. I was the first to go. And then shortly after that, there was Jimmy and then so on and so forth. They would compensate me something and they would pay me, you know, here's a, here here's some cash to do some work for us. We It was still there was loyalty there and that helped. So you decided to go back to college after that. Correct. I went what, to, what were you going for? A business management. Mm-hmm. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, <laughs> to be honest with you. I just went back into school big. All right, well. Now is the time, I guess, to go back to school while I had while I had the free time, and I made the most of that. I got my two year degree in business management. I didn't know what sort of business I wanted to get into, or where if I if I could be managing anything even. Which school? Uh, Ritten Valley Community College mm-hmm. in um, Branchburg, New Jersey. It's a good school, a good learning period too, because that also allowed me to learn a few things that would I could apply in like the selling field for wrestling itself or business management in general in life um, also helps in terms of where I would later go with my real life, my, my shoot job uh, <laughs> as they call it. Uh, I was wrestling on the weekends still. And, I was, and when I when we were going to rip me off TV and I was told, I'll be back, I'll be back, I'll be back. Um, I kept on knocking on and going back to the knocking on the ROH door. Like oh, when you expect me to be back, you told me I would be returning, but there was really nothing for me. There and was once, wasn't there? You had a chance to go back, but after, well, that's a, what's when delirious took over as the booker. Uh huh. And, and that was while you were in Japan. It was literally my last week I was in Japan. Um, I got an email from, I think it was Pierce saying that he had been fired and it was to the entire roster, not just not not just to me individually. Not for nothing, he did. Not for nothing. Pierce did go out of his way to check on me while I was in Japan, even though there was a pretty visceral conversation that we had over the phone when he called the office one time, which we all witnessed. <laughs> which you, Hagedorn, Jimmy, Sid. Ross, Sid, all witnessed and listened to and saw me at my angriest ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just blew up, especially when I was told I had not paid my dues. 
And Adam, if you're listening to this, I hope you remember that conversation. Thank you, Adam, for reaching out to me and you know, checking on me while I was there. And a lot of guys did, like Davey Richards did. And because there was a lot of times, not for nothing, you live in your own head. You're, you're kind of isolated when you're in a country where they don't really speak your language for that matter. And you're wrestling at least 10 out of 14 nights uh, on a tour or more for that matter. And after a while, after, you know, two months of doing it, you're beat the fuck up and you're tired and you get this is the most wrestling you've ever had the chance to do in your career. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that because you hear so many horror stories, especially about like the New Japan Dojo in the past, yeah. about how tough it is. How was the dojo for Noah compared to your American training and the tour itself? Because you did a lot of house shows, I believe. We did. Uh, the, the training was difficult. Like it had been the most intense since Brian's training when he took over the ROH school. Sounded more so from what you told me. It was a lot more. It was like you were you 500 Hindu squats or a thousand of those things oh, and then supplement that with jump squats, supplement uh, that with nearly 500 to 700 different crunches of uh, various types, whether you're hitting upper, or lower, or oblique. And some of those exercises, not for those ab exercises, I still do to this day because of how much they freaking carved me up at the time. It was hot as hell. In the dojo, you know, you're talking about like nearly 100 something degrees. You're the only one bumping around. You're the only one um, getting beat up. Let's say you were, you're training at the ROH school, there would be five other people training along with you. You had breaks in between. You had a chance to watch the spots being ran. You had the you had the chance to watch how something got how it got worked on. You would maybe have a few of the guys showing you how to work. You have like say Mara Fuji with uh, uh, Aoki. And they might be do something, but they might be the only two guys that are really showing you. And the, uh, maybe the other established wrestlers are something outside of hanging out. So they're not like getting in as much to like show you and work with you. Or you have Ricky Marvin who will just work with you one-on-one, -on -one, but you really don't get the chance to like see how he wants it done. So you're trying to like trying to figure it out on your own here and there. And sometimes the pacing in which they would run the ropes or bump or the footwork was a lot different than what we were taught here in the States. Not maybe a lot different, but they're more picky about it too, I guess. Was it the language barrier? Was it the culture? All of it, dude. Uh, I really, really mean that. It was it, it was an exhausting period of time because at that point, I know deep down in my heart that I went to Japan out of spite. I just did it to be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick it in Adam's craw and be like, yeah, I'm going to go there. I'm going to be good. And then he's going to wish he fucking never, uh, never let me go and all this stuff. And I'm going to find more bookings outside of this. And I'm gonna, and I, which I had done after ROH had written me off. My, all of a sudden, my bookings for Ring of Honor and some indies here that went from like, you know, maybe four times a month to like all of a sudden, I'm wrestling eight times a month or six times a month or sometimes 10 or whatever it may be. I was increasing my bookings up until the point where I was leaving for Japan. So when I went there, I was in this like game plan mode, but I was also, I'm not, it's, it's, it's a, such a mind fuck. You're on a, you're on a plane and you're going 16 hours across the ocean or 20 hours for that matter maybe depending on layovers and all other shit and you're thinking are you gonna ever come back that's how fucked up my head was at some point in time like I, I, again it was some weird 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 shit i was going through i have this sometimes this death complex where i was very concerned about dying while i was there and my mom being you know, halfway going, across the world yeah my mom also like she was half, have, having health issues so therefore like, i didn't and I had to respond to my mom much because I was in a fight with my sister and that's a whole, whole other conversation yet again. Like I, I was in my head a lot and you really had a hard time communicating with your peers. The Noah crew was very, very nice to me for the most part. Um, the only person I didn't think it was all that pleasant to me was Gimba. Who? Uh, Hiranagi Gimba, I think that's how you say his name. It's been okay. a long time. It's been a long time since I've watched my matches with him or watched any of his stuff. Well, who were the guys that you wrestled? Because you wrestled Kenta, didn't you, at a house show? Or? I wrestled Kenta. Yeah. I wrestled uh, Takayama. Uh, the the Hotness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wrestled him. That, And then I kid you not, that was probably my funnest match. I was catching a groove when I had those matches. Like Kenta was extremely cool. Let me do some things with him. They weren't like 20-minute contests or anything. They weren't main events. 
but I was wrestling go I was wrestling six man tags with Koshizaki or now Muchi Marafuji. Not to just keep dropping a bunch of names, but like I was wrestling like elite talent, guys who were been GHC heavyweight champion, tag team champion, um, junior heavyweight champion, junior tag champion. I, I wrestle a lot of like significant people. Nakajima, like I, I all those people like where I were guys I was working and learning from and trying to get better and more proficient with and oof, I, I in my time frame I was there for the few months I probably wrestled someone in the ballpark of 20 to 30 matches in those time frames and that again that's the biggest load I've ever done especially in one month's time frame alone and that that was exhausting it was exhausting you're getting beat up a lot but you're also having some fun here and there but they're also not for nothing. You go away and you, you go to your little hotel room at night and you're just exhausted. It's just all hell. You're getting taken out by uh, sponsors and they're trying to drink you up and they're trying to feed you everything you possibly can. And it's hot as all hell and stomach can't take it because the, the food's so different, not for nothing. So I, I lost like 10 pounds, 10, maybe 15 pounds while I was in Japan. And that sucked, because especially as a wrestler. You start losing weight, you start thinking you're a bitch. So that was frustrating. But some of the the silver lining was getting to know Eddie Edwards better. Um, he was there on tour like, shortly after uh, I got there. I remember you know being in the weight room and asking him questions about wrestling or just life in general, what he was you know planning to do for himself. I know I think there was a time that he was considering going back and becoming a cop and retiring from wrestling if things don't pan out the way he wanted to. Eddie Edwards is one of my favorite fake names in wrestling <laughs> his real name's eric yes. like me but i started thinking so in kayfabe terms his birth certificate says edward edwards <laughs> there's yes, a lot would. of a lot yes, of guys would. like that danny daniels yep. etc daniel daniels <laughs> you came back eventually and you turned heel in pro wrestling respect and that was the whole american psycho turn enough of this sugarfoot stuff uh -huh. you've, got, you've gone crazy you were in the hellions teaming mm -hmm. with hagedorn on indies and this and that but you had an opportunity to come back to Ring of Honor, I think. You were going to be the crown jewel of the embassy or no, something? No, no, that, that was not it, unfortunately. That was something I pitched. Oh, okay. I, I, I know, like, Nana was looking for something. He had been off TV for a while, too. He'd been, he had been out of Ring of Honor for a while, trying to come back to Ring of Honor. Um, Jimmy Rave had been gone, too. Nana was looking for something new to sink his teeth into. Like, well, I pitched an idea. Not necessarily maybe in, like the crown jewel but the diamond in the rough or something like something different like that we could work with and i, I designed tights and everything for that and pitched it to nana he said he liked it and whatever and, and he's like well let's go down to ecwa and see if we can try that out here which i think jim kettner at the time was the booker and promoter there and that didn't really pan it didn't go anywhere delirious let me know that he would like to bring me back and use me and he pitched the idea of this trial series at the time and the trial series, he wanted to start it with me. That match that Kyle O'Reilly had with Austin Aries was supposed to be Alex Payne against Austin Aries originally, and I turned it down. I had just come back, and I was exhausted, and I really, not for nothing while I was in Japan, I really, like, I was focusing on doing things their way so much, I didn't really get a chance to like rebuild me and find me as a wrestler and what I could change about me so much and i thought I, I would be lackadaisical and i wouldn't be no good so i so you I, didn't believe I, in yourself i, I didn't believe in myself yeah. i really really didn't i wasn't gonna take any other bookings for a while i was like okay let me just kind of like come back to our weight school and kind of reestablish myself after coming back from japan and then maybe but again I, again i didn't believe in me at that point in time but what kind of helped is pelly talked me into how to match with him at an indie, at an indie show and i said okay and there's not going to be a whole lot of people watching this, probably. Not to, to, to undermine the show itself, but it was in the middle of Pennsylvania. And it was off, kind of off the grid. So I was like, well, let me kind of see where my head is. Had, had this match with Pelly, and I thought it was really good. A match that you posted on your, on your um, YouTube page. And I was like, well, fuck it. You know, let's see where we can go. And I told Delirious, it was not that I wouldn't be interested in coming back. I just not, wasn't there. And then the second reason why really was it was against Aries. He didn't doesn't believe in me anyway. It would probably have buried the shit out of me once again. So what's the point? Why why the fuck do I wrestle somebody that genuinely, genuinely didn't like me or didn't want to help me or further my career when I was already there in Ring of Honor for that matter? So yeah, I maybe I, I as I say, you cut your nose off to spite your face. That's kind of what I did in that case. Do you regret it? 
there are days I do and there's days I don't because if I would if I would have went I don't know where my ROH career would have went but then again conversely what I turned Alex Payne into without Ring of Honor I'm proud of as well so there's a lot of the stuff I was able to do without an ROH backing or an ROH name I had the name of kind of like the people knew me about from Ring of Honor but I was able to develop this American Psycho I was able to develop a character and a voice, a name, uh, a style, new, a new style, a new moniker, everything. Not for nothing. Some people even forgot that that Alex Payne even existed when I was on shows. But that was a relief. <laughs> in, some, in, some, in some ways it was because it was like, okay, it's a fresh start. It's a fresh start. And there would have been a point in time I did pitch coming back to, to Delirious, but other people weren't on board with it. Um, I tried to even pitch away because me and, uh, me and Pelly had uh, teamed up. And we're doing pretty well as a tag team on the, uh, doing indie shows. Blackgate Asylum? Yes, that's correct. Mm-hmm. We had some cool spots and cool moves I thought would be very much uh, Ring of Honor styled. And we could probably have some fun with it. And that didn't really didn't go anywhere, unfortunately, in terms of like getting it to be a thing in Ring of Honor. And maybe even throw... Hagedorn was... Another piece of the, of the Black Gate puzzle, which we probably wouldn't have used that name while we were in, if we were in Ring of Honor, but just something like I would, I wanted us because we were all three guys that kind of trained together, knew each other, were close together. Let's try to be something together, and I, I thought that would kind of really help us out. And we all had significantly different looks. We could do different do different things. I could tell you just from what I saw Mm -hmm. that when you started doing the American psycho, I could see you were enjoying it a lot more. I was, I could see that you were much more into it. Finally, like we keep saying something to sink your teeth into and embellish. And it really shows when you are enjoying it or into what you're doing and it translates in your matches and you've been doing indies ever since. I know you're good friends with Joe Gacy. Mm -hmm. We've had a good slew of matches against each other. No, like over the last like I say five six years at this juncture, like there's been a lot of great places that I've had the chance to wrestle for. I got into CGW pretty much on my own volition. There's a, a small South Jersey upstart called NWA Force One that was very very fun to wrestle. And actually, I attribute that to a lot of my development. Sammy Callahan, who was the booker there at the time, I was friends with, and he believed in me enough to like let's bring you in, let's give you something, give you a shot, and try something different. And he gave me a platform to work with. And then he pitched a couple ideas. I got, had got a valet, which ended up being Kimberly, which then later turned into a great friendship and, and partnership in terms of like helping her out with her career and like help train her a little extra as well. Once I was teaming with Pelly doing tag team stuff, we having Kimberly as my valet and sometimes even tag partner here and there too, having that added to my arsenal and changing my look and changing uh, how I work in the ring, my my character, the way I talk, uh, having an attitude, some more poise about myself, character, character, like that helps. That helps. Like you had something, somebody to work off of. You had bodies to work off of. You had a story you could tell. You had a match to develop that had a place to go. Like that's what helps. And then there was there was a lot of people like watching it and the time like thank you also for posting lots of those matches and promos or whatever i would send you people caught that and they would reach out to me or i wrestle i wrestle from new york to maryland to out outwards to ohio or the the carolinas and i was doing it on my own i didn't need an roh i didn't need necessarily even a cgw i had that helping me out and i had good relationships with good people too that I was making not for nothing better friends than I ever had even on the ROH roster and people that I actually consider real friends to this day. And that that is what I was always looking for because I imagined as a wrestler, like you would make real friends in this business, relationships or stories to tell amongst people that were really true camaraderie for that matter or have real matches that you can go back and like really enjoy. Like again, going back to like I was saying, like Force One, a great place I like to wrestle for. There was a place in Maryland that unfortunately shut down. Uh, RCW, Real Championship Wrestling. Um, I wrestled for the Maximos in New York, in, Bro- in Brooklyn. The other month I went to Binghamton, New York with you for Excite Wrestling. Yeah, and- Excite, Excite's been a place that I've thoroughly enjoyed yeah. for the last now four years at this point i've been i've been there every single year for the last four years and they and they keep bringing me back though i 
kind of got banned there for a little while. Uh, <laughs> wow. A uh, guy kind of got in a fight in the crowd. <laughs> oh. One of the guys in the locker room's dad was in the crowd, and we had done an angle. Uh, we were a big faction at the time, and uh, we got into a big fight with the babyface side, and his son was in the, was in the ring that we were beating up, so we kind of like skedaddled a little bit. All of a sudden, I feel a freaking arm reach over the guardrail and grab me, so I kind of like hop over. I end up feeling like swinging going in my direction so I'm blocking it and trying to hockey you know block them and all of a sudden I start swinging and swinging and swinging in the crowd and then good friend Latin Dragon hops the car guard rail and starts punching the guy from the other side next minute you know there's a freaking all-out brawl mind you this is like a couple days before a day or two before my birthday my mom flies out to come see me wrestle for like the first time in a long time so she's literally like 20 feet away from this oh, action <laughs> so they're escorting my mom up to the locker room to make sure she's cleared i get back to the locker room and the commission's all fucking pissed off because there was a fight in the crowd and obviously you know from working for Navarre and other independents knowing that the New York State Health Commission is a son of a bitch when it comes down to all their fucking rules so that happens so I end up getting banned from Excite for like three or four shows which that sucked <laughs> that was a significant shows i really enjoyed most recently on point wrestling has been a place that i thoroughly enjoyed and i think they have a great great uh following amongst themselves um, another thing i want to kind of put over really quick is ccw's dojo wars um we were going back to personal respect and talking about how we felt like the students need a place to evolve and cultivate. And Dojo Wars, they stream that online? They stream that online and every week. Yeah, and that's the sort of thing that I was hoping we could do with respect. Yep. We started doing this online series, Slam Session, mm -hmm. and I wanted to have matches on there too. So it sounds like what they're doing, and obviously when you hear CZW, you think of the ultra-violent and bar barbed wire, mm -hmm. light tube sort of nonsense, but Dojo Wars is definitely not, not, not that close. at all. Not, yeah. not even close. Like, they they have solid trainers that from Goo, to, from Drew Gulak to uh, Joe Gacy coming in there. It, you have good it, uh, preacher. All these guys coming in to like really honestly like help everybody out. And then on Wednesday nights, whether it's prospective potential indie talent or whether it's uh, their own students, and they weave them in there. They want their students to wrestle an experienced wrestler. Why? Because they want them to get better faster. Why? Because they want more fucking people stepping through that door to pay for wrestling training and become something. Imagine. And, oh, wow. Exactly. Brian Danielson, myself, Pelly, and Hagdorn pitched this idea at the ROH Wrestling School, and it didn't go anywhere. We could have sold, we had inventory there to sell t-shirts, DVDs, whatever. I'm sure we could have had Jimmy or you or whoever want to stick around and help sell some stuff and help out. Whatever, at the time, we could have had extra, extra revenue coming in. Fans at Dojo Wars for CCW pay five bucks a head to come in and there's about 50 people in the, in the room watching the, watching these matches. They film them, they stream them, they do all this stuff. We could have been on top of that stuff and we could have had a little extra revenue to, to pull in every time and we also have more content to put on the internet. And you know, it doesn't even be edited crazily, Eric. It could have simply been, all right, we have this, we put it on YouTube, um, it's there for everyone to watch. And it been something that Ring of Honor could have capitalized then, which they did not do. I want to acknowledge Drew Gulak. I want to acknowledge DJ Hyde for putting that together and having something that's been done a damn good job for their guys. I've wrestled many other students, and I've noticed significant changes in them and significant growth in them, whether it's Dave McCall, Nate Carter, Frankie Picard, those guys definitely deserve a nod because they bust their fucking ass and they deserve 100% of the hard work they put into that place. And as we're winding down here, where do you see yourself going from here? Do you want to keep wrestling? I remember a few years ago, I put a tough enough video together for you mm -hmm. to try to get you on there. I guess that was the Steve Austin revival. Yep, yes. And where do you see yourself going? Do you just want to keep wrestling for a few years, see how far you go? There was a plan at some point uh, a couple years back about potentially retiring because like we opened the original show with like in my body he's a little you know, beat up from all this and it's gonna catch up to me at some point it's gonna catch up but i can't really say what my next goal necessarily is except for uh, i will say as long as i continue to have fun if i'm having fun doing this and i'm showing that hey there's something new for me to do hell i changed up my look just recently just to do something new and fresh for myself and add more to my dynamic. If I can keep adding more to what I'm doing, 
whether it's in-ring wise or promos or new opponents, whatever, that's what I want. And I want to continue to do that. If I end up wrestling for a WWE one day, fantastic. If it, if there's a chance for Ring of Honor one day, maybe. We'll never know. But TNA's not TNA even is not really, a, really, <laughs> not really a goal. Japan again, I don't know. But all I do know is that at this very moment in time, I'm enjoying where I'm at, what I'm doing, where it's helping people out or getting fresh matches and just trying to become the best wrestler I can possibly be, as cliche as that sounds. But the truth of the matter is I just really want to just continue having fun doing this. Well, hope people keep checking you out. And hopefully we also keep talking to you some more. Always enjoy talking to you. Thank you, Eric. Not for nothing. That's going to wrap it up for this week's A Few Words. Remember, send in your questions for the Q&A. You've still got another week. In the meantime, if you want to see Alex Payne wrestle in person, here's a couple of his upcoming dates in New Jersey. Pro Wrestling Explosion presents Round 2, Friday, September 9th at 7 p.m. at the Dunnelin Knights of Columbus. Alex Payne will be on the card, and you can get tickets in advance by emailing prowrestlingexplosion at hotmail.com. Tickets available at the door as well. Also, On Point Wrestling presents A Beautiful Day to Die, Saturday, September 24th at the OTW Arena in Williamstown, New Jersey, Building C, Suite 1. Doors open at 6.30, 7 p.m. bell time, and tickets are available at the door for $20. Next week, it'll be me by myself answering your questions. Hopefully not just pro wrestling and MMA, but anything. Next week in the first Q&A. On the way out here, listen to Fireside Chat's track, Settle the Score. Listen to more tracks from Fireside Chat at soundcloud.com slash fireside dash chat. See you next week. Not for nothing.
it's like you you don't look at when you think of, and I know I don't know in the, in in it went at for form and I, and at the no uh, well like no I wasn't called it was something that we well, well take it back so I I I, I and not for nothing. 